four o'clock, I'm going to call the uh, EIC meeting to order for the month of May. And I'll lead the invocation today. If you'll bow your heads, please. Dear God, we come to you with humble servants' hearts today, asking for your hand and your guidance as we make important decisions uh, that are in the best interest of the community. And we thank you for all of our community partners. And thank you to our staff who prepares us for these meetings each and every time we're here. Please help us go forward and make Kerrville a better place to live, work, and play. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. We have a visitors and citizens forum. And do we have anyone signed up to speak today? No speakers. Okay. And we were sent the packet, a link to the packet, and we had last month's minutes in there. Were there any changes to those minutes? <clears throat> Hear any? Uh, motion to approve as presented? Oh. Second. <laughs> second. Motion second. Okay, all in favor? Okay. All right. Uh, monthly reports. They're back. They're back. Are they back today? <laughs> Where are they? Oh, Katie's here. You had your head down. I'm sorry, Katie. Good afternoon. <coughs> Does my sound okay? <laughs> uh, good afternoon, EIC chair and committee members um, and Mayor Herring. Uh, Gil can't be here this evening. Uh, he is meeting with European investors in Austin. Uh, so I'll be presenting on behalf of the organization. As per usual, we experienced another very productive period. And in this period, uh, the KEDC has traveled to Austin, San, Anto San Antonio, Florida, and Kentucky, and has attended six conferences. <laughs> So here are some of the highlights. Uh, in marketing initiatives, you will see that I left a handout um, at your uh, podium there that shows uh, some of our uh, social impact and engagement numbers since the beginning of the year, as well as some trends. I'll let you uh, read that at your leisure, and I'm happy to answer any questions that you do have. Uh, we also had an opportunity to present uh, to Keller Williams, a group of local real estate agents, on how the KEDC can partner with them and what we do in our community. We also presented to the Citizens Academy, uh, which was a really great uh, event. Thank you again, uh, Julia, for that. Uh, and this evening, the KEDC has been invited back to Toby Lee's Highway 16 Drive uh, from JAM Broadcasting to share with the community what the KEDC is up to and help keep our citizens informed. In uh, BRE News, we had an opportunity to attend the Texas Venture Forum in Gala in Austin, Texas. Uh, there were a lot of great uh, speakers and panelists at that event, and a few uh, key items that I took away from that event. One is the Mayor's Task Force for Women Entrepreneurs. I left a handout for you all up there as well. It's just one page from that report. Uh, but the Mayor of Austin uh, brought a group of entrepreneurs together to assess the state of female entrepreneurship in Austin, and the report detailed their findings. And the final page that I left with you is a summary of the recommendations that they made to the Mayor of Austin. Um, while I do believe that Kerrville is different from Austin, I think that some of the key takeaways that they uncovered in their community may also be applicable to us as well. Uh, I also was turned on to an inaugural study by Wells Fargo, Women Owned Business. Uh, it was a first study of its kind that was published this last March, uh, commissioned by Wells Fargo, and I uncovered some interesting economic development statistics. Uh, one suggests women-owned businesses continue to fuel the economy, representing 39% of all businesses, over 14 million, and employing 12.2 million workers, generating 2.7 trillion in revenue. According to this report, um, Wells Fargo Impact of Women-Owned Business Report, the number of women-owned businesses between 2019 and 23 increased at nearly double the rate of those owned by men. And from 22 to 23, the rate of growth increased 4.5 times. Uh, so I thought that those were some interesting takeaways. And I have both of those full reports. If anybody would like to see them more in depth, please just drop me an email and I can send you the digital copies. 
Uh, we also attended the INBIA's International Conference on Business Incubation. Uh, that was very interesting. Uh, one of the big takeaways that I, I learned in that event is that there's an acronym of ESO. It is actually a sub-niche of econ de economic development, excuse me, that stands for an entrepreneur service organization. So an example of an entrepreneur service organization would be Geekdom in San Antonio or Tech Block in San Antonio. I did attend uh, a panelist conversation with the CEO of Geekdom and I found it interesting to learn that many of these entrepreneur service organizations are a hybrid uh, endowment with for-profit. Uh, so a lot of times their endowment uh, comes from a, a municipality or a university that helps covers their programming expenses. And the for-profit in specifically the Geekdom model applies to their co-working spaces. But maybe some interesting information for us to keep in mind as our community continues to explore some of those ideas. Uh, we also attended the San Antonio Manufacturers Association trade show uh, in San Antonio. We were introduced to some cool tools and resources for our top employers in manufacturing. Uh, one example is we had an opportunity to connect our educational partners uh, with Tech Labs, whose company provides training equipment such as simulators, virtual reality, tools for HVAC education, and heavy equipment training. Uh, we also had an opportunity to connect with the SAMA president, Dan Yoxel, uh, and invited him and his team to our next quarterly roundtable luncheon, uh, as we believe that that will be beneficial to some of our top employers who are also in the manufacturing space. Um, in childcare news, we had an opportunity to get caught up with Jeremiah Romack at the Croc Center. Uh, and he reports that they are still in the midst of their planning. Their community assessment has concluded. Uh, anecdotal evidence so far suggests that they will be entertaining um, a capital campaign to build a standalone Boys and Girls Club. Now, they still do need the blessing of their leadership, so this isn't for certain, um, but he believes that their strategic planning is moving that direction. But what that will mean for our community is that it will allow a 100% increase in childcare seats which will increase their capacity from their current around 150 uh, childcare seats served to around 300 to 350. Uh, the timeline for this is about 18 months to five years because it does include a capital campaign, uh, but something to keep in mind uh, for our community as that rolls around, uh, we can do what we can to support their efforts. I also uh, have an early childhood impact plan um, this was about 28 pages, so I didn't print one for each one of you, but I do have one here, so if somebody really wants this, you can take it home today. Otherwise, I can send digital copies to anybody else who's interested. Uh, but I had a great conversation with the executive director of Early Matters in San Antonio this afternoon, and this has some really good ideas about how our community might um, address childcare initiatives in our community, um, and it's from a neighboring county. Uh, so again, anecdotal evidence suggests that they're probably experiencing some of the same challenges that we are here. Uh, yes, I also had an opportunity to meet with Dr. Kendall Young um, to, in regards to providing even more opportunities to high school students. Uh, she does provide a consulting uh, service to uh, students, not just in our community, but across the state. Uh, who are looking to um, secure internships and uh, make a really great impression when they are applying for colleges. Uh, she, so she works with them one-on-one -on -one to develop unique opportunities. And there's a student in our community who is looking for an opportunity with a business incubator, a business accelerator. So I look forward to continuing the conversation with her and providing more opportunities for those students. Uh, there was also a Shriner student uh, by the name of Zachary that reached out to us. Uh, he's looking for a job in Kerrville and wants to stay local, but has been um, challenged finding the right fit for him. Uh, so I met with him, reviewed his resume, and introduced him to six uh, leaders at different local organizations. Uh, finally, I had an opportunity to meet with a CEO of um, Vencrew LLC, who is a partner with Stretch Zone. They actually have a facility by the little HEB across town about the possibility of conducting or of contributing some education to a potential business incubator or accelerator. Um, yes, and uh, that concludes my report, and I'm happy to answer any questions that you might have. Do you know if uh, Salvation Army has land already purchased for that facility, or is it going to be multiple pieces of land? Or 
based on my conversation with Jeremiah, uh, their reason, their most, their current intention is to use their current campus. Um, as far as I understand, uh, they are planning on moving some other of their programming efforts off campus, but that will be one that will stay on their current piece of real estate. <clears throat> That's a one month. Um, well, I wasn't. <laughs> I wasn't able to be present for the last meeting, so th th this could be this could be forty five days. So, had a hard time keeping up. That's a lot. <laughs> That's a lot. <laughs> That's great. Thank you, Katie. Thank you. I couldn't do that much anymore. <laughs> All right. We also have a monthly um, report from, let's see, REIC projects update. And Michael's not feeling well today. Is that right? I will fill in as best as I can. Sure, thank you. How's everybody doing this evening? Let's see. Um, really no major changes as far as um, the Scott Schroner golf course if, if Ashley and them have some updates on it but all the projects are you know what's been talked about before there hasn't been any new updates same thing with the Olympic pool and the Callow theater improvements um, Travis pump station uh, it, that got approved by council so that's moving forward um, downtown street area streetscape uh, that project is still ongoing, so we know, understand there's a lot of traffic implications with that, but it's moving along, and Kyle may even have an update on when that's going to be finished, but it's it's ongoing. Um, really not necessarily impact the EIC, but just kind of in general regarding the downtown stuff, two trees got removed in front of Arcadia. Those were uh, sick trees. There was also some that were removed over by the AC Shriner house as well. Uh, we did have two arborists that came out there, took a look at them. They agreed with our assessment on that, so those did get... Uh, get removed. Um, any questions on any of the projects on the list? Are they going to do, I guess, a, a sidewalk repair over there in front of the Arcadia? Yeah, so they, they did the, uh, the uh, stump grinding and everything, so we're still trying to figure out kind of what the next step is. Um, I, obviously, the bricks have always been kind of a big concern. Uh, any bricks that are salvageable, they, they have been relocating or saving and try to figure out what the next future step is going to be with that one. Um, some of those I think will be fleshed out in the downtown master plan as far as what would be the best ideas for landscaping or, you know, types of long-term sustainable projects, you know, for that, that type of landscaping. Anything on the uh, easement acquisition for the downtown river trail? Oh, g great question. So we're down to kind of the final two. So we're kind of wrapping those things up. Knock on wood, hopefully we can get some of that resolved and get some resolution on that. But we did get uh, some of the some of the challenging ones we've we've knock we're able to knock out. So hopefully we'll come to you in the next month with some good news. And I, I meet with I meet with um, with Michael Hornus uh, usually a week before the meetings, not always, but a lot of times. Um, you know, and just thinking about the situation and, and hopeful for that to happen. Also, um, if, if we don't have completion next month, I think it's worth considering whether we give Michael some um, direction on when to just step back and say, you know, we've, we've gone at this and maybe we need to look at changing directions. I don't know how long we've been doing this easement acquisition, but it's been... It's been a long time for one stretch of the river trail. They, they yes, ma'am. They're, you know, they, since I've been here, not even eight months yet, I know they've been working on it, but they've tackled a lot of those easements pretty quick. So when I came on board, there was way more than just two remaining. Sure. Uh, so no. we've tackled, the team has tackled quite a bit. So. And it is not a reflection on, on city staff at all. It's, yeah. it's more <laughs> of a, um, well, for one thing, our contract on, on this particular item States that construction will be completed by 2024 in December, and we're obviously not going to make that timeline. So, um, I think if we haven't made any progress by next month, then we need to have that conversation about do we redirect our resources at this point, or what do we want to do? Um, is that how? What? How does everyone feel about? Great. That? So, Kim, if I may interject real quick. 
Oh, hi, Frank. I, I have the, good afternoon. I have something kind of a little bit later in the discussion okay. for this specific topic. Okay. So if you don't mind, just kind of wait until uh, I'll give you that presentation. Uh, give you a little bit of overview of, of kind of where we are and some okay. potentials. Uh, you know, then maybe you can have a little bit more dialogue Perfect. with that some better information. Good. Sounds good. Other questions? Okay, thank you. All right, moving along to financials. Good afternoon. How is everybody? Okay, so we are looking at April financials um, for 2024. Uh, your February sales in the community brought in April sales tax of $395,000. Um, that puts you year to date at $2,880,000. Um, this is a 8.5% increase compared to April of 2023. And um, digging into the report from the comptroller, we had a couple of prior period payments that came in for this particular month, one in retail trade and one in public administration. But uh, retail trade was up 4% this month, food service was up 4% this month, and uh, construction, it's kind of volatile, especially because of development going on around, but um, they were up 50%. But then there's some categories that fell a little short, so the net overall was 8.5% increase over April of 23. Um, Let's see, we received May sales tax last week, and that's 493,000. That uh, reluctantly is five and a half percent decrease from last May. But um, things are just fluctuating up and down there, just constantly watching that and hoping to make budget. Right now, we are 30,000 behind the budget estimate, but you know, we're just tracking and keep watch on that. Next uh, revenue down is your interest income. 126,000 for the month, 91,000 was interest earned on your revenue bonds, and then the other 35,000 on the rest of your uh, investments. We did purchase two um, short-term investments for you uh, in April. So that was a U.S. Treasury note for 18 months at a 5.05% earnings interest rate, and then a commercial paper of $4 million uh, with a nine-month maturity at 546. So we're getting back into that, and Right now, interest is better than our budget estimate of by 572000 So just <laughs> trying to get in and earn where we can. <laughs> uh, next section down is your expenditures. So monies that went out the door this month were 17000 City of Carville admin contract, uh, your monthly debt service, the two uh, short-term investments, and then down in your projects. I told you we're going to uh, move over, reimburse the city's capital improvement fund from uh, EIC's fund. So 40432 in your downtown utility streetscape project, we did transfer over the 125000 for the river trail. Just going to keep moving those over until y'all tell us to stop. And then 75000 in the golf course improvements. That way we can give you a monthly update on how those projects are moving. So your total expenditures, $2.4 million, with the net change in position of a negative $1.9 million. Most of that was the short-term investments going out. Could I ask you a question? Yes. What, can you remind me what we sold the bond package for? What was the percent for that? 409? Or was this one 396? 396. Okay. Moving on to the cash flow. Um, not much here. First column down to the bottom is $26.7 million is your cash balances, and then the columns to the right have been updated for what we expect to happen this fiscal, the remaining of the fiscal year. Um, jumping forward a little bit, you did, you are remitting um, the second installment to Sid Peterson because they got, they uh, fulfilled substantial completion of the surgery center, so that would be going out in May, and then... Uh, Golf course improvements are it's moving, so we'll start seeing some activity on that. And then last slide here is your financial analysis. So top left chart, same stuff. Your sales tax comparisons, uh, month over month, year over year. So your overall fiscal year average to through May is a little less than 1.3% under one, uh, 2023. So not too bad. Um, bottom left chart is remaining project commitments. We added on all the new ones, these golf course improvements, Olympic Pool, Calo Theater, and Shriner University. And then your cash analysis to the right there. 
right now your text pool average yield is 548 for the month so your investments are right there in track in line with those but if the market starts changing we may we may see that drop okay and that's all we have today questions for trina thank you All right, so item 6A uh, was something I asked to put on the agenda. That's the GO team process and procedures. And in the package, there was um, the current procedures. Uh, actually have two applicants here. And um, not to, not to both, both applicants expressed in some way or another some confusion or desire for more clarity um, on those procedures. And so... Um, we were two for two, so I figured that we might want to look at those. Um, so rather than hashing out all those policies and procedures here, there's seven of us, and we can't have a quorum if we have a separate meeting, but I would um, really like to have two people and myself volunteer to meet with um, city staff um, and to meet with um, you know, other relevant people that are determined to, to be able to contribute to, um, to this discussion and then bring back recommendations hopefully next month, um, but no more than two months later for um, consideration by the full body. And I don't, I don't want to volunteer you, Kyle, but as a member of the GO team, are you willing, <laughs> are you willing to do that? <laughs> okay. So if... It, can we get one more person who would consider doing this? Hey, Greg. All right. Okay. Now, oh, we don't have Mike here, but I think that um, we can move forward without a vote on this if everybody is in consensus of this item. Yeah, if y'all have consensus, then that gives us the right direction. And okay. So what I'd like to do is try and get a time scheduled. Um, I know that Michael and I talked about kind of the people um, that we'd like to involve, and I just don't have that written down off the top of my head. Um, but if we could just work on getting a, a meeting scheduled, and I'm, I'm hoping for one, maybe two if needed, but to get as much out of one meeting as we possibly can. Yeah, and, and we'll, we'll get an email to y'all three and then get some dates that work for, for y'all, and then we'll get something scheduled. Okay, thank you. In the meantime, you did receive that in your packet, so if anyone else does have um, some recommendations or questions, and even to the applicants, if y'all have specific um, recommendations or questions that maybe we need to delve into a little bit, that would be appreciated because we do want to make this process as, as clear and easy um, to navigate for everyone as possible. Um, and I know I figure that y'all probably have Michael's email address. Okay. Um, so if you if you have time and would like to contribute to that, it would it would help us in our process too. All right. So that's six A, six B, Texas Department of Transportation text alternative um, alternatives. Mm -hmm. Do we need to push that, or are you ready for that one? I'm ready for it. Oh, that's okay. right. He was going to have Kyle talk to him. So, all right, here we go. So with the timing of, of this, you mentioned the contract expiring into December. We wanted to bring something else for you to consider. Uh, basically, what TxDOT does on odd years, so upcoming 2025, they will issue a uh, transportation alternatives call for projects that actually starts December of this year. They'll send a little one-pager of, of what they're looking for. Uh, so I wanted to give you a quick overview of that program, maybe give it a little uh, insight as to mm -hmm. you know, future directions for the River yes, Trail. Thank you. Um, again, just kind of going with that. So in 2023, we had applied for the River Trail from the library to uh, G Street. This is a two-step application process. We went through preliminary applications, and essentially, uh, TxDOT looks for a really simple, high-level uh, details at, at that point. You know, where are we going? What's it connect to? Does it meet funding eligibility requirements? That, that's the, the big, biggest component. Is it on system? Is it off system? That, that gets a little bit more in the detailed application phase. So preliminary ap application phase is just with district. 
detailed application phase actually goes all the way to the commission in Austin. So uh, as you'll see on that second point, there two, over 250 million was allocated in 2023 uh, through the infrastructure law that was passed. And so TxDOT has multiple funding sources they can use. With that caveat, there's also state funding that is not federal uh, allocated to some of these projects. If they see something in Kerrville that says, hey, we've got to do this, and it doesn't necessarily make it for uh, through the commissions, they can come back to you and say, okay, we, you're not a TA project, but we're going to do this for you. Uh, so it's not limited to the 250. Uh, that's just what they like to, to broadcast. Again, the two-step process, really the, the keynote from this is what I have in bold there. Applications uh, are after the deadline are null and void. Appli applications that do not meet the eligibility requirements are you know, null and void, that you stop there. Detailed application phase, if you check all the boxes, it's, it's really pretty simple. Uh, so the, you know, for the step one. Step two is really where we get into to the weeds. Uh, the one that we've been awarded thus far, we actually did a conceptual design, you linked HEB, hospital, all, all the different uh, groups on the south side of, of, uh, of the river, you know, 16 and, and 98 connection. They pulled off the on system you know, and left, which is the tech stop, uh, got an uh, off system, which is city roads. We got all that sidewalk funding. So uh, just really, you know, quick, sit, you know, let you kind of, you know, skim through this, but uh, they've got a whole variety of, of banks that this falls into. Uh, we're not the rural uh, under 5,000. We're not part of an MPO. So Kerrville is kind of an anomaly in, in regards to a lot of their funding. But we do have opportunities. And we've presented them with a few projects that are, are very, uh, very high re highly regarded. Uh, a lot of times we, we get it negated because we're just, we're not on 35 or, or we're not, you know, in some of the major metroplexes. But, uh, but they did give us some, so that, that is good. So here's a, a quick overview of, of that timeline. I mentioned December. This was the 2023 call. So December 2nd, they issued, like I said, little one, one or two pager that says, hey, we're issuing the, the projects. Here's how much funding. Here's the projects we'd like to see. We want to see shared use paths. We want to see accelerated uh, bike cleans. We want to see all these different things. It's going to be in that little narrative. And then so... The end of January, uh, you come up with a preliminary application that's not, you can submit 100 of them. I, I personally will ask you not to do that because <laughs> I, don't, I don't have the time for that. Uh, but we do have some very viable options in Kerrville that TxDOT in the district office has been pleased to see us uh, submitting. The one caveat between uh, preliminary and detailed is you've got to find your uh, easement and right-of-way acquisition. So in 2023, we pulled our application from this because that, that is one of the uh, the main items. So Meaning you have to have those already secured? You don't have to, but it is highly, but because of the competition, basically you have to be, you'll see later on, readiness is, project readiness is a pivotal point for, for TxDOT. If you're ready, if, if actually if you have it designed, you're, you're going to score even higher. Uh, they, they leave it broad, but it, so it's subject to, you know, to the reviewers. Uh, so we'll have a little meeting. Uh, you know, this one was March 27th. They basically said, hey, you check all the boxes for the preliminary application. Now you're going to move to the detailed application phase. Those are typically due in June. This was June 5th. So like I said, before the June 5th deadline, we pulled our uh, ourselves and noted, notified districts said, hey, we're not submitting. We didn't have the, the easements. You know, we, we didn't have anything uh, from the pavilion to G Street. We, that wasn't even anything we've been exploring. Uh, but then if we would continue that uh, in October, the commission said, hey, these are the selected projects. So October of 23, December of 22, that short little span is when, uh, it, when all that happens. Now, you might think, okay, we're, st we're just now installing the sidewalks in 21. I want to be clear. I've, I've done a lot of the red tape to, to get us through. And so I would actually you know, uh, emphasize getting some of these applications in because I had to do a lot of uh, a lot of text dot stuff, uh, writing procedures, sitting down with Julie and saying, "Okay, I need you to review this, and hopefully it makes sense." Just checking a box, and so having all that stuff done gets us more of that readiness. You know, is the city ready? You know, is the city certified? Is the city you know have they done all these different things? Have they completed a project? So by the time we get to this one in 25, we will have the sidewalks across the river done. Uh, and so here's some of the, the, the four bullet points of the criteria they tell you. If you kind of get into the, the details, you can find out that when they mean safety, 
what they're talking about is safety for the pedestrians, but also the vehicles. How do I get pedestrians off of our roadways uh, and, and, and the roadway specific? It doesn't have to be the river trail. It can be adjacent, like we're doing on the south side of the river. Uh, but that's what they're looking at is, is safety. How many you know, vehicle to vehicle crash counts, vehicle to pedestrian, all these different avenues. Connectivity, I mentioned HEB and the hospital. They, they wanna see how you're gonna connect to town. G Street to the library, if, if we elect to do that. Shriner University, doesn't seem close, but when we're trying to link that to downtown, it, it is, it's a big gain for the city to, to link our university and some of the patrons on the east side to downtown. So that, that's gonna be a, a big key for them as looking how that connects. Uh, geographic equity and, and community support. Uh, our community has been well documented of, of supporting that. Ashley has her River Trail Master Plan. We have the you know, 2050 plan. I, I submit all of that stuff whenever we do these applications. They love it because that's what they're looking for. They wanna know how we're gonna you know, invest in, in our citizens to get them safely throughout town. Uh, and then I mentioned the project readiness. So. They're gonna give you real brief overview. The development, it, basically that's, do you have it designed at, to some level? Whether it's concept, it could be 100% design. You know, that, that's, that's really the city's decision at that point and, and how much we wanna put forth the effort prior. Uh, but then the project timeline, is it gonna be spanning out you know, three, four, five, six years or is this gonna be a, a one year project? Uh, and then the constructability. How feasible is it to actually get in there? Is there environmental hazards? Is, you know, all these different avenues. That's what they're looking at. Uh, and for the most part, all our, our stuff is you know, geared up, ready to go. We've got a few uh, little easement acquisition issues to take care of between the library and G Street that you know, if, if y'all decide to do that, we can move forward with that. Um, so again, in, in the 2023, 20, this was the, uh, the little bullet points that were in that little one page. You, know, you can see it connects, you know, construct segments on the bike, Tourism trail. That's going to probably be a big one for the next few years. TxDOT's trying to get a lot of the uh, wider shoulders. I think it's six foot in some areas, eight foot in others on, on the rural roads in in towns. They're they're trying to get something like the river trail. How can we get those normal bike users off our roads that are just trying to use this for tourism? Uh, and then you, you can see the uh, just enhanced access and, and safety to school related destinations. We don't have a safe routes program going right now. That ended in, I believe it was 2019, was the last call for that one. Uh, so this is emphasizing some of that. This did have the, uh, the higher uh, funding source than, than normal. So, uh, like, so that's just a, a quick example of some of the things that they look for. Um, this is a 20% match by the city. Uh, you know, the uh, river trail that we had proposed from G Street to library was I believe about four, four and a half million on the latest update. Uh, you know, right now we've got funded for a million. We, we spent some of that, uh, but basically we, we're at that 20% match. And what that is, it's a reimbursement basis. And it's, I mean, it's, like I said, it's a, another checkbox on the application. If you're ready, you got all the plans ready, you've got the easements, now do you have the money? And you know, we would have the money, so then it's just you know, one more little checkbox that, that we go through and say, hey, we're, we're ready to do this, just you know, partner with us and let's go. Uh, we do not qualify for TDCs, so I did not get into to what that actually means because I'm, I'm not really sure what it means other than mm -hmm. the fact that we're not eligible. Uh, <laughs> I, I don't uh, waste my time for that one. So, <clears throat> uh, so these are some of the things that, that are not eligible. Environmental mitigation, we've already done that. We hired Hewitt, uh, you had that done in 2021. Hewitt did that environmental study for us uh, on the downtown concept. Any utility adjustments, uh, that's on, on behalf of the city itself, landscape improvements, you know, uh, unless it's part of the project, uh, you know, we, we, you know, we don't mess with that. Easement and right of way acquisition, don't mess with that. They, they want the city to, to pay for that. So uh, again, if we get up front you know, and have it all acquired prior to the detailed phase, that's not even a, a component. You know, we just check the box that we've, we've done everything. Uh, so I, I kind of want to highlight that this, this is one of the little check boxes that I, I do. Uh, we have to go through that. The, the big one are, are, are these two. So on, the, this is the 2023 application. And like I said, this is why we elected to, to pull it. We didn't have any uh, utility re relocation, but we did have easement uh, acquisition that was still pending. And not knowing the timeline, you know, here, here we are on 24, still not uh, signed up on, on just the small section. Uh, basically, if you check yes to that, your project 
yes, you can submit, but it's not really worth it, to, to be honest with you. Uh, so keep referring to the south side of the river. Th this is one of, I think, three pages on the 2021 application that we connected, uh, or show, show the connectivity. DPS, apartments, you know, HEB, that this is what they're looking for. How, how much does this connect to you? How much does this uh, have an impact on, on the city? And, and how does this benefit what their, you know, their end goal? Uh, and like I said, this is exactly what they're looking for, is, is moving patrons safely through town. So uh, just a little bit, a little bit more, uh, you know, different examples of the same area. So, uh, and originally this application did have the Highway 16 and uh, 98 components to it, but we were actually recommended to take the on-system components off. Those are going to be a tech stop project. Uh, they did notify us that that, that is happening. So uh, there will be connectivity, not the 16 bridge, but just uh, on the highways themselves. So uh, and so this is actually what we got awarded was, was Wesley Coley and, and Hill Country. So just to show you, you know, what you submit for may not be 100% of, of what you get. If they really like the project, they're going to fit it in the scope that they want. You know, we were, I think, $5 million on the original application. They, they downsized that to about one three one four, uh, And so, just, like I said, just wanted to give you some examples of how that would pan out for the application uh, you know, in approval phase. If elected for River Trail or, or anything, this is the timeline we'd be looking at. Uh, basically, what we would do is, you know, if, if you said, go get all easements you need from the library to G Street, or let's say where we ended on the West End, uh, go from Guadalupe to, to Knapp. Get all the, all the easements, you know, any right of way, anything like that done now before the June. So not, not the January, before the June deadline for the detailed application. Uh, then in December, when they issue that notice, we'll see exactly what they're looking for. And then in January, we'll submit the preliminary application. Not a requirement to have the easement acquired at that point. That's just a quick overview. This is the project we have. It, it matches what you're asking for. And then in June, like I said, that, that's a critical date. That's when we submit the detailed application. That's the one that says everything is, is ironed out uh, and, and we're ready for the project. And then October of 25, we would be notified, good, bad, and different, uh, uh, whether a project, whether the commission awarded a project or not. So uh, I know that was a lot, and, but is there any questions, comments? So uh, no, when, when I was on council, we, uh, we had that application mm -hmm. in front of us to approve. So. Um, as a separate body, does that go from our recommendation to council for approval? Is it the funds flow through? I'm going to have to <laughs> the look funds at the other side of the room for flow that through one. the city, and we re would reimburse the city on this, or is EIC a, a, can they be? Can we be an applicant? We'd have to look at that if EIC could do it itself. But really, I think the city would take on the grant the project and everything else and then at some point we could either partner or co-sponsor or sponsor with the ic um we could figure out the logistics of that but and this is always an 80 20 where unless we... you do like he had mentioned the safe house the school program i think the last one was last uh, 2019 was the yeah. last one uh, they uh, they did one last year as well um mm -hmm. they had one last year because uh, we had applied for safe house the school um they kick them off every now and then, but we had gotten awarded $3.28 million for sidewalks to connect to school. And really the requirement of that is it has to be within two miles of a school. So if that one does come around again, you can apply for both TA and Safe Routes to School if they don't accept it under Safe Routes to the TA. But we'll look into the, the city side versus EIC. I think it'd probably be easier just with city council taking on everything because they're going to probably want city council to do it. But we can look into that and get back with you all. So and it, it maybe a, a funding agreement because I had to go through a certification, uh, you know, so we, you know, to basically do the project. It's called the LGPP, Local Government Participant. Uh, I don't even remember what all it says. Yeah, <laughs> it's a day and a half long. I, uh, I, I know that. A much. Time. Are these uh, pretty much? If you check all the boxes and you have all all of your stuff mm -hmm. ready. Is it pretty much guaranteed that you'll get it? No, ma'am. No. There is no okay. guarantee. I, I, I was trying to find the 23 numbers. So, you know, it was $250 million allocated. Uh, it was in the billions that was requested. Mm -hmm. uh, it is highly competitive uh, oh. because there, there is such a, a huge need. Uh, we've actually had projects that we've 
checked every box and made it through district and we, as, as one of their highest priorities and the commission you know, didn't select it. I actually didn't select any from the San Antonio district that year. Uh, rhyme or reason why, we don't know, but it just depends on. And on it has to be for, it's for a government entity only, these, these grants? I, I believe so uh, because a county and a city can do it. Uh, I think there's other mechanisms for non-government participants. Okay. So based on your timeline, it would be the right time next month to make some decisions about do we do we continue or do we have the easement acquisition on the on the stretch we are now and then what's left and do we want to include that in an application in December as well and then work through that? Right. Okay. And as far as if, if we elect to postpone this until this call like so there, you know, there's no guarantee, but you know, we would have to get you know, everything from the library to G Street to be a, a really a, a feasible option. Mm -hmm. Going from the library to the pavilion that we have now, uh, that's not really connecting what, what they need. Uh, we, we need to get all the way to G Street to make it fully connected. And how, and how many easements, agreements, or acquisitions have we made on that? Or do we have left? To we don't have any past the pavilion. Past the so pavilion, we, we've then. had conversations. You know, we've had conversations that have been very good, uh, with one or two that you know, may need further discussions, uh, but nothing, nothing ready yet. That would be a hard ask. Is is that what you're saying for December? For December, as far as as far as you submitting getting the easements, or, or which? Oh, well, as far as you easement. submitting the, and. No, th that wouldn't be bad at all. Uh, essentially, what John did for the concept plan is all that I would submit in uh, in the December January time frame. The like I said, the June time frame is the you know really the key Specific. component for that one. Yeah, you basically have a year, right? Yeah, roughly. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And that's just for the easement acquisition. Is that going to find us money? Doable. <laughs> yeah, I mean we're they're they're plugging away at the easements uh, pretty heavily and and. Uh, they're they're definitely making progress, so I definitely think it's doable. If I remember correctly from a prior conversation with Michael saying that he had had those a lot of conversations and feels pretty good about the the east side um, as far as getting those those right. easements. So. so definitely something for consideration next month um, as far as his direction on where to go at this point as far as right because we would probably come back to you and if if you elected to go forward with what we have now uh, to ask for an extension. Uh, you know, it's going to take about two months to go through the, the bid process, get awarded by council. Uh, you know, we're already looking, you know, and then probably another month after that to get bonds and an actual contract executed. So you know, we're already looking, you know, at September, October time frame. That's just probably not going to happen for the construction within that time frame to, to meet the December t uh, timeline. So it's either going to be an extension or we explore this option. So would that grant also require, for us to submit the grant, would it require a public input period, like if we were to? Uh, in, informally, yes. So what we would ideally do um, for any type of these grants, and you know, Kyle on the engineering side, but we do take a public component of it. So any information that you get where people are supporting the project, you know, sponsorships, you know, if, if local businesses, you know, like, hey, we like this, having letters of support, all those go a long way into uh, supporting these projects. So indirectly, yes, but it is, they do want to see the public input side of things. And, and there's also a resolution requirement by, by council. Uh, so that's, you know, like I said, indirectly, uh, we do have that on council. Folks can speak to that on, on behalf of that that night, and you know, we, we reach out to, to folks just that we know are in support of it, that kind of match up. You know, some of those areas like the hospital, uh, we had had them submit on the 2021 application. So that that's the stuff that they're looking for is you know the, the key elements, uh, you know, and connecting all these pieces. Yeah, the other thing too to consider on you know as y'all are thinking about the extension of, of the funding, that funding also goes a long way. Even though there's a 20% match, it's not a maximum max. So if it's a $4 million plus dollar project, even though we may have already put 20% you know, into a project, 
having that additional funding there that is available does go a long way, you know, into it where let's say they were only going to give $3 million out, but there's another 900,000 in there that does go a long way sometimes into supporting those projects as well. You don't, you're not limited to just the 20%. <clears throat> um, and the more you go above it, the more points, I guess you, you kind of get on that. If we applied for this, and got it for this particular segment of the trail and decided to come back in future years for additional segments, would that be precluded or could we potentially come back later for future segments? Oh, we can come back as many times. Uh, you know, and, and so that's, like I said, we'll be wrapping the, the south side of the river up by the end of this year before this application would, would come to fruition. So, uh, I mean, everything looks good. You know, they'll they'll have that in their notes that hey, Kerrville Kerrville has already done these, and they, they like like the repeat uh, applications because they it's less on their behalf checking our policies and procedures that uh, the program requires. Yeah, and the other one too we didn't talk about on this. Um, Texas Parks and Wildlife has grant programs, all different varying sorts. And so last one we applied for was in like the late 90s. And so we definitely plan on applying for Texas Parks and Wildlife grants as well for various projects. But Shovel Ready is a big one like he had talked about and completion of projects. Both of those go a long way in getting future funding. Oh, thank you for being here. It reminds me to, um, just to the, the, we usually get one or two objections to us taking money every year in our budget and applying that to resources that the staff provides us. And I think many times this year we've seen how city staff is assisting this body. Um, and thank you for being here and sharing that with us. Okay. All right, the next five items are available for executive session. Um, we have the funding agreements up coming up the first and so I would say if we're not ready to take action um, then we can have a recommendation to move it into executive session and I would like to go through all five of those um, and then see where we are at the end of those five if we need to go into executive session also as y'all know we got an email from my case um, who put these agreements together for us and he's not able to be with us today so I am um, I do not it's not my desire to push any of these items at all for the applicants or for ourselves, but if there are specific legal questions, we may consider whether or not we need to push the item to next month. That being said, let's go ahead and move into item 6C, um, the application for, uh, I'm sorry, the economic development grant agreement between Habitat, Kerr County, and the city of Kerrville. And I know the applicant um, is here as well. So do you have any <coughs> presentation for um, us on the staff side? Mary with Habitat has a presentation okay. if y'all would like to go through that. <coughs> Good afternoon, everyone. <coughs> um, we just wanted to provide an update of what's been happening behind the scenes um, with our project. And we plan to give quarterly updates to the EIC board, if that's okay, along the way. And we're just kind of thinking about this kind of format just to throw, you know, throw it out there for y'all. Um, but just some big updates or, or just updates is we are at 44 houses because we had to cut three houses because of water retention and detention. So we're doing 10 traditional habitat and 34 workforce housing. And I just really want to press um, the importance that, that all of our houses will be affordable. It won't be sold at market rate and any of that. And affordable is defined as HUD and Texas Department of Community, Housing and Community Affairs sets a, an affordable price at 275 for our area and also income limits. So I just want to dispel any myths that we're not selling market rate. Our plan is to be well below the 275. And in fact, if we're not, our agreement specifies that we will return any subsidy that we've gotten from EIC. Um, but just want to do that because sometimes it can be tricky because market rate can seem affordable if someone is not spending more than 30% of their income. But our goal is to cut our construction costs without um, changing the quality so that someone in our target range can qualify for that house. Um, so 
those are just kind of those updates. Um, there's some milestones that have happened. Um, we have, I have an amazing board. I have the best board in town, sorry. Um, <laughs> no offense to y'all. Um, <laughs> but um, we have the experts in the community working on it. We've just broken it up in big, you know, four categories, land development. Kevin Bernhard's leading that. Workforce home design, that's how I write out. Um, our marketing and customer experience and sales is Micah Four and capital fundraising is um, Heath Gregory. Um, the big part of this is we have submitted our plans to the city um, with the new, um, without those three lots. Um, so we've made that deadline. Uh, the workforce home design, they are just really looking at how are you cutting budget? How can we can get our plan is we can build these for 180,000 um, a house, but we're trying to cut it to 170. Um, so that we could qualify more homeowners that would fit in that income range. Um, so, and then marketing sales is already working on HOAs and, and CCRs and all of that. Our timeline is right on track. Um, we hope to get this approved in May if we could, because we would like to start infrastructure in July. We have the bulldozers out there re ready, revving their engines, so we're ready to go. Um, and everything has been on track. We haven't had any glitches with any of that. This is the, pl the plan that was submitted to the city. And you can see the three lots are um, on the left-hand side. And we'll make that a green area. So I think it'll be really nice for the Western Home Place because, you know, we'll, it'll be grass and maybe soccer field kind of thing. So... Um, that was really all we had as an update, and Greg Richards is here to help us walk through any changes with the contract and that. So, so um, do you have anything to present? Are you here for questions? But I have a question for you, Greg and Mary. Um, Y'all have had a chance to review the contract, and what we're looking at is acceptable to to you on the on the habitat side. And our board also. Um, so I, I just got off the phone with Mike. I didn't realize he wasn't going to be here, but had an emergency in San Antonio. Um, we had several uh, back and forth revisions on the grant agreement, and I believe we've uh, we've resolved all the issues, uh, save one, which was kind of a conceptual change um, that Mike was going to present, and I was going to be available for questions, but since he's not here, I'll present it to you, and you guys let me know what your feedback or questions are. So Habitat's plan is to self-fund all the construction of these homes. Um, they plan on doing that through fundraising, and then effectively they'll take their bucket of money, they'll go build these homes, and as they sell and make a profit, they'll just keep redeploying that revenue back into building more homes. Uh, they've got a pretty, uh, pretty good goal this year to build 14 homes. Uh, three of which would be the traditional habitat kind of community, uh, roll up your sleeves and get out there and build it, and then 11 of them would be uh, built through a contractor, kind of in a traditional model, but going still trying to stick around this 180 per, um, per lot budget. All right, so as Mary and I were talking about this, we, you know, we had to consider the possibility that the fundraising goal does not get fully met, and then what? Uh, is that, does that just stall the project? Um, and we've got a, a pretty healthy timeline to, to get all these homes built and sold, you know, but the what if. And so not as a, as a primary uh, effort to fund the construction, but as a, an alternative, something to be considered, uh, Mike and I talked about the concept of EIC subordinating its lien to be able to facilitate habitat um, borrowing some bank funding. The best way I can explain that is, is an example. So let's say that we've got a $180,000 construction budget and Habitat has raised 150 of that, uh, but they still need the other 30. So they go to a bank. The bank's going to say, well, we want first lien position. And so uh, the bank would loan that money, that $30,000. Habitat would subordinate its debt, uh, which per lot were right around $50,000. So between the first lien that the bank would have for 30, the second lien that Habitat would have for 50, 
you've got $80,000 uh, in um, liens on a project that is presumably going to be valued somewhere in the 250 to 275,000 range by the time it's done. And we went back and forth on a lot of metrics that we could try to include and where we ultimately landed, which I, I believe you guys have pushed back on and said, and eh, we just didn't really want to do that, but would be to give uh, Dalton as the city manager the ability to, to kind of look at these on a case by case basis. And, and the example I gave is just one of many I could come up, many that I could come up with. It all just kind of depends on the circumstances. And again, this is not first level <clears throat> funding. This is just a potential alternative that might need to be considered to keep the project uh, moving at a good pace. So I can go into some more detail if you'd like or answer any questions. And I'm also really familiar with the rest of the agreement. So if there's any other component you want me to address in Mike's absence, I'm happy to. So the grant amount is the 2.26 million. When you're talking about subordinating, how does, what does that tell Yeah, me so the, the way this works is, you know, real similar to other projects EIC has done, is that grant amount uh, is coupled with a deed of trust lien that Mariposa will grant to EIC. And so, for example, if they were to decide to go out there and say, we're going to sell all these at market rate, uh, below, I mean, above the 275, we're going to sell them all for $500,000. They don't qualify for the grant at that point, and they have to pay the grant back because the EIC is going to fund this on the front end. They're going to do the, because basically all the cost EIC is being asked to fund are the infrastructure development. So roads, utilities, that kind of stuff. So they'll get that built. <coughs> they'll ask for reimbursement. Presumably EIC would pay it, and that's before one stick goes in the air. Okay, if they don't meet the qualifications, and there's a bunch of reasons why they might not do that. That's certainly not their intent. But if they did, they're going to have to pay back this grant on a lot-by-lot -lot basis if they don't meet all the criteria. So that lien that, that EIC has is it's guarantee to say, if you don't meet the criteria, you pay us back or we're going to foreclose on that lot. And so what I'm suggesting is that EIC agree, again, not, not agree up front, but just agree to consider on a case-by-case -case basis possibly subordinating its position to facilitate bank financing. Greg, if, if there was something written into the agreement uh, to create the possibility, the flexibility to be able to do something like that to a limited number of lots, and I don't know what that number is, but let's just say up to five lots, in this subdivision at any given time, provided that they were in compliance with all the previous houses that they may have done and uh, that the houses that were subordinating are, will be marketed at or below that. Um, it seems like that would be more expedient uh, for both Habitat and the EIC board if there is a number of those lots that this body would maybe feel comfortable um, providing for at any given time up to a maximum amount. So if there was a number like that, maybe this is, I'm sure that maybe more of a Mary question, but how many houses might that be? And I, I fully expected that if, if I were to go to Dalton and we agreed to something like what I've suggested, there's going to be conditions. And that's, that's kind of where your statement goes to is, yeah, we, we would consider doing it, but if these conditions are met. And certainly if we want to try to bake some of those into the agreement, we could look at doing that. Um, it's really just... Well, if, if it's if not in the agreement, it. I'm not sure how Dalton could... Yeah. Could could act on behalf of the EIC board. It, to me, it would seem like that would probably need to come back here. But I guess my my, my point of view with regard to the rest of the board is, you know, I, personally, I would feel comfortable with a limited number of lots being subordinated, providing the project is progressing and that they've been doing what they've said they're going to do. Just personally, just to streamline the process. 
Well, I think if we if we said you know no more than five lots at a time and a you know total loan to value of not more than we'll pick whatever your percentage is. Uh, those are two really objective criteria that we could we could work with. I think ultimately we just want to see this thing move forward. If you know if it requires a little bit of wiggle room here and there, I think we understand that's how business works, but. Um, I do think it probably needs to be in the agreement, and that's going to make it tough for us to give you a, a stamp this today, you know? Sure. If we've got to make those changes. Um, I don't know if we could do an email vote on something like this as soon as you get that ready. No. No, no email vote. <laughs> <laughs> I withdraw that. Oh. Can, um, can we call a special meeting? Y'all can, yeah, y'all can call a special meeting if you want. You know, really, as y'all are kind of thinking about this, and and I think some of the data, like right out of the top, you know, off the top of my head, you know, the question that I would have is, what would be the delta kind of on those five homes? Where if it's the five home kind of, you know, um, leeway on there to do it, could it just say, hey, in the first year we're not going to be aggressive and build fourteen homes, and if you build only ten homes? and then scale it up so you could build that capital to be able to continue that sustainable option. My only concern with it is we all know how agreements can get. The more convoluted and complicated you get, the more room for error there is. So in just kind of what ifing it, you know, kind of thinking about the contingency, okay, they don't raise funding for the 14 homes or whatever they're trying to do. We, we, we do the agreement where, all right, up to five homes, what happens if they can't do it then? So then everything kind of reverts back and it kind of goes back to normal where I would almost kind of, you know, uh, and again, I'd have to look at the numbers. Um, I hadn't, hadn't had a chance to catch up with Mike on it, but I think I've, I'd ask the question, what's the delta between doing a five home leeway versus saying, hey, let's not go aggressive the first year and only doing 10 homes to build. Would that be able to raise the capital, stay within a more simple parameter versus try to complicate the, the contract even more? I'm not. I'm not personally in favor of of approving without having some conditions that EIC is comfortable with. Um, whether that means we go into executive session and try and get that knocked out today, or um, and come back and and ask let me let me interrupt you. Uh, Mary reminded me, as I should be very familiar with my profession, time's money. Um, so here here's a proposal to consider. Let's not put it in the agreement today. Let's see how the fundraising goes. Would you guys be willing to allow us to come back and propose a more thoughtful modification that includes a subordination piece if that's needed? Because we're not at the place where we know it's going to be needed. Again, it's not, it's not the first uh, course to try to uh, fund the construction, but that would facilitate us landing the plane today we can keep moving on, and then if we see that that's going to be a reality, we could come back to you if that would be okay. I, I, I think that's a good recommendation. That way we can sit down with Mary, Greg, and, and their team as well. We can look at it to kind of help them through because, you know, we don't want to delay the project any more than we have to. Um, we don't want to complicate the project also. And I think that if they get the, if they hit the funding side too, we can get with Mary and say, hey, maybe it is only 10 homes versus 14, and then we can <coughs> come to y'all with something more simple than something more complicated. Anyone have any problems with that? Sure. So is there general, I won't hold you to it, but general consensus that you would entertain that? Perfect. Any other questions for me? everyone comfortable with the agreement and no specific legal questions for Mike at this point or is there anything else that we need to consider that we may need to direct towards staff okay. so at this point I will entertain a motion to approve the EIC grant agreement between Habitat for Humanity Kerr County and EIC for the installation of public infrastructure. So, so moved. Move. Oh, go ahead, please. Or second. Okay. Move, second. <laughs> All right, we have a motion and a second. All in favor? Unanimous. 
Thank you. Okay, we're going to move on to our next agreement. This one is the EIC agreement between Shriner and EIC for the funding of the, um, so we have this in two different agreements, this one being for the talent and workforce development. Any presentations? So we, uh, city staff does not have any presentations on these. Um, just in general, we worked with Mike and, and Charlie and everybody, Dr. McCormick, everything was good to go on the agreements and they were able to get it done and um, no issues. All right, so from us, and our, I'm sorry, I haven't been asking. Do we have anyone signed up to speak on this? We have no speakers. Do we have anyone signed up to speak on any of the items under? Um, 6F. 6F, okay, very good. All right, so no specific staff, um, but applicant and staff are here to answer any questions that we may have. Are there any questions? Do you have any status updates or anything on the project? We don't have any uh, additional updates. We're just uh, uh, got our engines ready to go. So okay. as soon as we get the green light. All right. All right. Yeah. So the main thing on that contract, I'm sorry, I wasn't able yeah, to no, please. It had, had to do with the uh, timing of the payments. The timing of the payments? Is that, was, was that the main thing that we were looking at in that contract? In it. Mm -hmm. What? I mean, that was just the basic change. Yeah, just kind of an overview um, in Article 1, Section A, uh, just talked about, and it's broken up into two separate ones, but it was not to exceed the $3 million amount for the total for both both projects, oh, okay. um, and it was spread over a five-year period uh, with front-loading of a greater amount in year one and then and, and then split up. So in each agreement, Article 1, under the EIC's obligations, it'll show the year one and the payment not to exceed, and then years two through five and the payments not to exceed for each respective one. For our last conversation yes ma'am all right so hearing no discussion and no one signed up to speak I'll entertain a motion on item 60 for the agreement between Shriner and EIC for the um, Center for Talent and Workforce Development so moved motion second and a second all in favor please let me know by raising your right hand all right it's unanimous and we're up again, right? <laughs> so item 6E, EIC grant agreement between Shriner University for and EIC for funding uh, Shriner's athletic uh, facilities. And again, we're gonna do, we're going to complete the talent and workforce development project first, and then we'll look at the second project. So we're approving today um, if that is your desire, the second grant agreement that will uh, be occurring after the talent workforce development. Again, also no changes from discussion as far as our last discussion with financing, Mr. Rice? No changes. No changes. Okay. Other questions? I thought that the gym was already being renovated. Is that not part of the athletic facilities? We'll um, we'll be working on some of this uh, concurrently as okay. we go. So. Oh right, and yeah. our agreement will follow the way ours is structured. Right. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So based off of the initial proposal done uh, by Shriner. You know, the only, again, the difference, we expanded out to five years and, and offered, you know, did the funding front-loaded in year one uh, and then two through five. The it, there's going to be some things that are running concurrently. They'll still have the reporting requirements for certain aspects of it. But, it, yeah, it, it's not going to impact EIC's funding and distribution okay. funding. Any other questions? Motion to approve the second EIC agreement with Schreiner. So moved. Second. All in favor? Thank you. <coughs> okay, so we are on to item 6F. Uh, this is the funding application to the city of Kerrville. Uh, the okay, this is the application to the city of Kerrville EIC 
Um, this is from James Avery Kostman, and this is the first time we're seeing this one, correct? Right. Yeah. So this is for grant funding for the installation of a traffic signal on Highway 27, an amount not to exceed 140000 Yeah, so the GO Team met. I'll um, let Kyle talk on that one a little bit, but really the biggest concern out of the GO Team was making sure that what funding was going to be was in compliance with the law. Um, outside of that, we've confirmed with um, Mike Hayes, and everything is is in compliance with it and falls in line with the projects. Is, is there anyone that um, Kyle, you see it on Go Team? Um, I looked at I looked at I, I had a discussion with um, with Michael Hornis when when I met with him. Is for the rest of us, have we had any discussion on this item? Um, so, no. okay. So I don't know how everyone feels about. Um, Taking action on this tonight, going to executive session. Um, Someone here to speak about it? No, I don't. Well, it, I, there is a citizen oh, speaker. Yes. yes. From the CRAC, from James Avery. Yes. So the presentation, yeah, let's start there. Presentation from staff and or James Avery on this item. What does that look like? Uh, uh, staff does not have a presentation, so I apologize on that one. Um, basically, right there at the Shriner entrance, where this project kind of came about, you know, they are on shift work, and uh, Paul Zip, James Avery will kind of talk more about that. But basically, this is a TxDOT road. They've gotten approval. They've done a traffic study on it to support this. Uh, it did sh and what they're looking at doing is putting basically a on-demand kind of traffic signal right there at the James Avery intersection. 90% um, of the time, it'll be flashing yellow to keep traffic flowing, but during those shift, uh, during the shift times uh, coming in and out, then it would sw swap to a, a an on-demand you know lighting. Um, they've talked about this for for a while, and I'll turn it over to Paul. All right, I apologize. I apparently missed the note, so I didn't sign in saying I was going to be speaking. <laughs> Hope that's okay. You're the, you're the applicant. You're good. All right, I'm good. <coughs> want to break protocol. Uh, my name is Paul Zip, and I uh, have the privilege of serving as the chief operating officer for James Avery. Uh, this was actually part of a request that was made of TxDOT when we initially moved to the site in 2015 and broke ground. Uh, and ultimately opened in 2016. Unfortunately, at the time, uh, TxDOT uh, didn't view that it was necessary, uh, didn't view that it was uh, open and available to us, needed to do some additional study and things of that nature. So we've been biding our time, and then COVID happened, and so we bided a little more time. Uh, and so when we came before this body uh, several years ago, almost 10 years ago, if you can believe it, uh, when the, your predecessors approved the uh, assistance with getting the jobs opened there at the site, uh, this was contemplated, just wasn't uh, available as a reality. And uh, as um, uh, Dalton was just describing, the intent is to have it as a, a light that's flashing uh, uh, yellow. There's a traffic study that we had provided, uh, prepared about a year ago. In addition to that, uh, we've also started uh, engineering work um, and uh, have a contract with uh, Hewitt Engineering here locally in order to help us develop the actual uh, traffic lights that we put in place. The intent there is probably going to be three. Uh, if you think about it, eastbound, westbound, and then uh, the exit from the facility. On any given day, we have anywhere from 175 to 200 associates that are working on the first shift and a comparable number, maybe a little bit less on a given night, leaving the second shift. The second shift entry is not as big of a concern. It's primarily that exit of the first shift when you are thinking about trying to exit. And that was one of the other limitations when we initially developed the site. We had plans to create kind of a horseshoe such that you would have an eastbound track and a westbound track and there'd be an entrance and an exit, ingress, egress to the site. Unfortunately, there were existing driveways on either end of the facility, so we were forced uh, per code in order to be able to help have a single artery in and out. And so that kind of limits, is very much a pinch point. Uh, there are a number of photos that were provided in the uh, application. And essentially what happens is you have the shift ends, you have 175 to 200 associates trying to exit. Presently, with no light, uh, you're trusting in the uh, traffic to uh, hold up long enough for those folks to make an exit. If you're turning right eastbound towards center point, you've got a good running start. It's not as big of a challenge because you have two lanes there. But if you're leftbound, if you're oh, sorry, westbound, turning left, you have to cross those two lanes and the turn lane to get to the single lane that's hitting into Kerrville. And so the intent with this traffic light would be that it would give us a signal there that would give a safe 
exit and entry for all those folks as well as the folks that are transversing back and forth. Presently at that shift change, we, when available, have off-duty officers either from Kerr County Sheriff's Office or KPD that will stand out there and direct traffic. So there's also a safety element not only for our associates that are leaving, but also for members of law enforcement uh, that have been willing to help us on their uh, downtime to help direct traffic to make sure that we can safely uh, ingress and egress the, uh, the work, uh, workers in and out of the facility. And so there'd be an opportunity there for that to diminish and uh, a more, uh, I'll say, even flow. Uh, what generally ends up happening is it's, it's uh, a 10-pound need and a 5-pound bag, uh, and so it's a very slow uh, exit. The good news is, is generally when the, when the law officers, law enforcement officers are available, it's a very timely exit. Folks are generally out in less than 30 minutes uh, versus having to wait around for up to an hour uh, or more in some instances, and they're not, that's just leaving our property. Uh, at that point. And so the ingress, uh, when you look at second shift coming in, is not as harsh because primarily you've got folks coming eastbound and then we paid for a turnoff and donated it back to TxDOT so that the, we could have our little exit ramp uh, to get into the facility. There is some traffic coming from Center Point and Comfort that does have to cross both lanes coming the other way, but generally that's not as, um, not as heroic an effort and a much lighter traffic uh, in that time frame because that shift is delayed uh, until later uh, into the afternoon, what early evening. What are those times? Uh, we close out 4.30 on, on first shift, and we open, open second shift at 5 o'clock, um, 5 o'clock, 5.30. Um, so we've got some folks that come in a little bit early to make sure that there's a smooth transition into those, uh, into those facilities. And then that second shift continues on until 2.30 in the morning. So is that overlap there? I'm sorry. There still is that overlap, kind of. of There's a little bit. Out, uh, trying to get as in. long as we get a timely exit at first, it's usually not a problem. Um, but there, is, there, there can be. Uh, in, but normally, it's not that big of a deal. We normally have uh, supervisors, managers, and a few key personnel that are helping in the transition of certain of the processes that need to get a running start. Uh, that could be a little bit overlap, but you're talking less than a handful or two handfuls of folks in general. So at this point, what has been asked or what was submitted in the application is a cost-sharing uh, exercise. Um, and uh, we submitted not to exceed, you know, basically it's a, a range because right now we're still working on the engineered plans in order to come up with a final number, uh, but the request is uh, up to $140,000 is what we had talked to uh, the GO team as well as uh, city staff about uh, previously. So is that like a 50-50 split? It's or? a 60-40 split. We'll take 60 and we're not, we're not adding in the engineering study, that's on us. If there's a budget overrun, that's on us. I mean, that's, it's ours to manage. The, what will happen with the project when it's all said and done is all of it will be packaged up and handed to TxDOT to maintain and, uh, and monitor, uh, upkeep, et cetera, when it's all said and done. The other piece that has come into this, and we included this in the application, with the proliferation and the growth of the uh, aggregate production operations up and down that portion of 27, um, which has, has grown significantly with Martin Marietta, uh, Kerr uh, Sand and Gravel, as well as the move of uh, Ingram Ready Mix over to that uh, side of town. Uh, there is an increased level of heavy truck traffic, which we believe also would be, a, would be beneficial for us in the aggregate safety of the community for us to have the potential for a light there. Our intention for our use uh, and our request is only, as uh, Ms. Ross was explaining, uh, that it'd be a flashing yellow during normal uh, business hours. We've got folks that are going to be on there on their shift. They don't need to be having a regular turn signal unless there's someone who's engaged at the intersection. But the belief is that over the long term, if there is continued growth in the community, 27 is going to be a much more heavily trafficked corridor. And with the heavy truck traffic that is moving back and forth east and westbound, we believe it would probably also be prudent to have that as an option to at least kind of slow things down. I cannot comment on the speed limits that are in, pro, uh, in place presently. It's probably worth a good study, but that's outside our scope. Are there any further questions? Questions for Mr. Smith? Okay. And Kyle, do you want to speak to, uh, for the go team? <clears throat> no, we met with the Avery folks a, a month or so ago. Greg and I did and, and visited with them a little bit about it at their facility. and. I mean, this is obviously a, a safety issue, and as far as protecting lives and our and our jobs out there at James Avery, it's very critical to have that safety there. Now, the question that we had in the GO team was, does this fit within the the scheme of EIC funding? And we've checked with Mike Hayes, and apparently it does 
check all the boxes. It seems like it was like quality of life and also that, protecting jobs yeah. and things yeah. of that nature. So, yeah, yeah. But, I mean, um, and just as long as it does check those boxes, I think uh, the go team recommend to go ahead and bring it before the board. Yeah, the other thing too, and it's it's not, it, I'd say it indirectly impacts the city because um, they ultimately pay for it, but they pay uh, overtime and extra shift for law enforcement to go out there. Sometimes they do have difficulty dealing with it because it is a staffing issue. Uh, we don't directly provide it, we indirectly provide it, but there is somebody that typically goes out there and mans it. If they are on shift and they do take a call, it takes it away from, from that. So there are some logistical challenges with that as well. And this will mitigate that. How are we on our budget? Are we good? This was on our radar when we talked about all of our budget you know, concerns. Um, I don't know, Greg, if you want to talk about that at all. Um, yeah, I mean, <clears throat> you're right. I mean, we aren't as flush as we have been. Uh, I appreciate, I just want to say I appreciate the cost-sharing approach here very much, and I think that helps. I think we all recognize the need for, you know, for that traffic control so the question is can we afford it yes we can but it's obviously we're yeah we're at that level where we're, we're, we have to watch yeah, every dollar but... <laughs> and was there a separate speaker signed up <coughs> um yes with avery's um tom polk yeah, just right okay Yes, part of it was uh, Tom and I are going to be, so Tom Pogue is our Vice President of Manufacturing Operations. He is responsible for all of our sites, Kerrville being the largest of all those. And Mike Van Boeven is also here with us, uh, part and parcel, because when we have the second meeting, provided we have the opportunity to be at the second meeting, uh, Tom and I will not be here. So didn't want you all to have an unfamiliar face in the event that uh, there were questions that arose about the project, uh, but provided that we have that opportunity. Uh, these two gentlemen will be one of one of the two of them will be here. I will not be. <laughs> I will be swarmed by high school and junior high campers. So, <laughs> assuming that we move forward with this, what's your timeline on it? Uh, we have a tentative uh, completion date of January of twenty five. Um, so, moving relatively quickly. Um, part part of it for us is uh, now that we have, if you will, the uh, the license to proceed with TxDOT, we want to go ahead and make sure that we complete the project. Um, post haste so that you know if there's a change in perspective that we don't end up having to continue uh, with the process that, that we have been undertaking for the last eight years um, and come back and have to wait another six eight years uh, beyond that I'd like to make a motion that we approve a funding application in the amount of $140,000 for James Avery Craftsman for the installation of the traffic signal on Highway 27. Motion and second. All in favor? Very good. Unanimously. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all for being here. And let's move to item 6G. And Let's see, funding application to the city of Kerrville, EIC for Heart of the Hills Heritage Center um, in an amount not to exceed $2 million. And this was part of our um, grant package, bond package. Mm -hmm. As far as the agreement itself, is there anything y'all wanted to kind of talk about it? This is, uh, again, everything is going through EIC for, you know, the funding piece was not to exceed the $2 million. And they're kicking off with schematic design and uh, making progress. Do y'all have an update that you want to share? Would that be okay? Um, I am not the expert on the HHHHC stuff. Um, she is. Can you talk to us? Yeah. I can give a quick step but, up and then turn yeah. it over to Angela. Yeah. She's going to okay. have a little bit more. Uh, we met the other day. We had 60% design submitted to us. So that's actually in review right now. Uh, Heritage Center has engaged the exhibit designer and coordinating that with the Marksman Design Group. So uh, it's progressing. We're looking at uh, September being 100% design complete. And so uh, I will turn it to Angela for more detail.
Good afternoon. As Kyle mentioned, the 60% design documents have, uh, we've progressed to that point, and by September, 100% design documents will be in hand with the intent to proceed with instruction, construction in mid-October. Uh, during this time frame between now and September, the Marksman and Fisher Heck design build team will be working with our exhibit design firm that the Heritage Center has on contract to finalize interior design plans and to make sure that everything is moving forward so that when we do begin to develop and install exhibits, it will be the right uh, facility for our exhibits to be installed. We are also currently working to identify a potential consultant to work on a fundraising campaign to move us forward um, to our potential opening in early 26. Questions? So are we considering a, f a funding agreement or a funding application? Because I thought we had approved this with the bond package. Yes, so with the $2 million that was already approved not to exceed, so basically any of the um, construction documents or design documents or the funding piece would still come through y'all for approval. Um, and then once you hit the $2 million, then it's just reporting after that. But yeah, so this, this marksman piece is for the... Do what? Yes. Okay. So, okay. All right. So I'm, I'm a little, I'm a little behind. So it's going to end up uh, calling, consider calling a public hearing for it. Sorry. Let me, let me check this real quick. Because we're going back through this right. with each no, piece. With each component. Yes. We so go this back is the, through. the four step process. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, you, you did mention, yes, this was, it, it wasn't approved as part of the, the bond tranche. It, it was a recommended project at, at that point. Uh, we've done the uh, Olympic pool, the golf course. Each, each of those has brought a funding agreement back to you. Mm -hmm. The next meeting will be a public hearing. Then it goes to council, does the, the whole uh, process. This is the, the first of, of that application process for the funding agreement. Let me back up just to be clear. On the last application, funding application, do we call a public hearing for that one as well? And if so, do we need to um, revise or reconsider our um, motion to 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 say that we're going to call for a public hearing yeah so it, Kyle, appreciate thank you for stepping in on that one Kyle so yes this is this is the one that's going through the process so all the other ones had done the public hearing this well, we one. haven't done one on the on the on, James Avery we need to do a public hearing on James Avery it's what she's asking yes I actually think so it's word it's styled the same way on our agenda as 4F and 4G. Yeah, the answer is yes. So I, I, just like any other process that we go through, so yes, so I apologize on that one. So if y'all amend that one for approve it and then call for the public hearing. Will, uh, will it be on all of them? On Habitat and Shriner? Also? No, no ju are, just, the, the yeah, just on, basically it would just be on the James Avery because that one's brand new. <laughs> Okay. And then HHHC, because we haven't, that's the one that we haven't done the public hearing on. <clears throat> they say funding application. Okay. So, okay, so, okay so, so the James Avery one is just the application piece of it. So we will bring that back to y'all. Um, and then it'll, we'll, we'll get that process done. So we'll make sure we highlight all of that. So James Avery one is good. Public hearing for HHHC. So we do not need a public hearing on the the James Avery one. Not not on this one. No, this is just for the go team and the recommendation and the approval. So that one will now that one that y'all approved it. Now it'll start the process for James Avery. Okay. Right. Okay. So what we need to do in order to take action for item four G is to um, recommend that we call a public hearing to um, for the Heart of the Hills Heritage Center um, grant not to exceed $2 million. Are you looking for a motion, ma'am? I am looking for I one. Would move uh, exactly as you, as you specified. All right, second that. Are you good, Keisha? Okay, we have a motion and a second. All in favor? Well... That means the second half of the second sheet is not applicable anymore.
that all done. Right. So good job on that. Um, I heard through the grapevine that uh, Mr. Anderson is not going to be re-upping his application. Um, and I want to express my thanks for those of you, and we probably all know this, but we have a wealth of knowledge in John and his economic development background and experience will be missed. So please email us and keep the keep the thought sharing going and um, we wish Maggie all the best as well. Thank you. So, Thank you very much. I think, do you have any comments that you want to? It's been a pleasure working with you and this and this board and I think this is probably one of the most important boards in the in our community is just what you do what we do it's, and uh, I've enjoyed it and it's just a pleasure working with all of you um and the other the other seat uh Gary's seat um he was at the end of his term term this year but um you're gonna you've applied to yes. okay so I believe that either everyone other than Mr. Anderson here on, on this board, except, that's right, I talked to uh, Mr. M Mayor Herring as well. So Mayor Herring is going to, you want to tell us your plans? Sure. Um, I'm finding my time limited. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I believe the council will appoint a new council representative of this board. Uh, probably at our next meeting. I know that we're going to do the reappointments and appointments for this board at that meeting. I do, I want to echo what Tom said. This has been a wonderful board to serve on. And uh, I admire your dedication. I admire your vision. And I'm thankful to have been uh, part of the team for a while. So uh, I, uh, I look forward to the great things you're going to do. You probably meant you were either mayor or council member when EIC was was formed sure. and found it right? was we put it on the ballot the voters approved it and uh, oddly enough I was the first person appointed back in 19 oh. <laughs> <laughs> talk about circle and circle <laughs> anyway uh, it's been a pleasure thank you for all you do and thanks for all the staff all the staff you thank you very much. any items for future agenda here, 531, we are adjourned.